Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, joint webinar series between Glyconet and the American Chemical Society Carbohydrate Division. We have two very interesting speakers today. Um, and the first of them is Professor Mark Nitz, who is uh, at the University of Toronto. And uh, Mark got his PhD actually uh, here in Edmonton, where Glyconet is with uh, David Bundle uh, back in 2001. And he then went on to do a postdoc with uh, Barbara Imperiale at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And then he, he started his independent career at the University of Toronto, and he's been a full professor there since 2014. Uh, professor Nitz's work um, is very, he has a variety of things going on in the lab. He's gonna be talking to us today about some of the uh, carbohydrate related work on bacterial biofilm uh, molecules. And these are molecules that are involved in uh, uh, pathogen biofilms. And uh, Mark has been doing some really nice work unraveling some of these very unusual and complicated uh, molecules. So with that, Mark, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks Warren. I'm gonna tell you a story today that uh, we published recently about a low affinity probe for this polysaccharide that's involved in a wide variety of different types of bacterial biofilms. And I noticed the participant list when uh, Ali started admitting people and there's certainly some familiar faces in there. So uh, you guys have done some of this work. So I'll try and point out some of the great stuff you've done along this project as I discuss it. So if you're not familiar with See if I can advance here. Yeah. The bacterial biofilm problem, it's, it's a pretty serious medical issue. Uh, about 65% of persistent infections in humans are due to bacteria in these biofilms. And so what this is, is bacteria that have formed a colony at some type of interface within the tissue or on the surface of some type of indwelling medical device. So the problem, the medical problem with these, once you get these biofilm related infections is that they're really antibiotic resistant. So you have to go on these extremely long courses of antibiotics to try and clear the infection. And if you can't successfully clear the infection over a long course of antibiotics, they actually have to do a second surgery and replace some type of indwelling medical device um, with a clean device after healing. So you can imagine that's maybe not such a serious problem if it's something that's easily accessible like a catheter, but if it's something that's more uh, invasive like a hip replacement or a heart valve, that can be a really serious issue because uh, taking one of those out and putting them back in are very serious operations. So we got interested in this problem because it is really a, a carbohydrate based problem. Most of the bacteria that form these biofilm infections do so by producing some type of uh, carbohydrate at their surface that forms this extracellular matrix that holds the bacteria at the surface. So the way that biofilms are understood to occur is that you start with some type of uh, situation where your bacteria are in the environment or in a planktonic state and they find the surface that they have some type of nonspecific interaction with. And it's generally thought to be mostly nonspecific, although there are some specific interactions that have been discovered. So once they form these, uh, once they bind to these surfaces, then if the right stresses are present, they can start uh, secreting an extracellular matrix and forming these colonies. So the extracellular matrix in this picture is the brown stuff. And as those grow and multiply, they actually form these quite large colony type structures. So in confocal microscopy experiments, quite often you see these mushroom-like architectures where potentially you could even see water channels in these architectures. And once the bacteria get to this stage, this is a full mature biofilm. This can be quite a large structure. We're talking potentially hundreds of microns tall. And they're really antibiotic resistant for multiple reasons. Um, one of them, and probably the most important one, oops, most important one is that the bacteria deep within the biofilm have undergone a large metabolic shift. So they're no longer growing and dividing nearly as rapidly. So any type of antibiotic that you use to treat those bacteria uh, is gonna be less effective simply because the bacteria aren't metabolizing very much. The other thing the biofilm does for you is it also protects you from the host immune system. So it's impossible for phagocytes to actually get in and clear these bacteria because they are protected by this extracellular matrix. It's also been shown that things like uh, Horizontal gene transfer can happen very quickly within these biofilms because the bacteria are so close together. So if any other antibiotic resistance uh, builds up, they can be very quickly shared with them within the colony. So we became interested in this extracellular matrix because that's really the key to the glue holding everything together. And one of the things that attracted us to the problem was that surprisingly, a lot of different types of bacteria and different species of bacteria produce the same 
polymer that is key to forming these biofilms. So um, you can see there's this list of bacteria I've got on the side here. That's not a complete list, but we've got both gram negatives and gram positive species, lots of bad actors in this list. And they all produce this polymer, this poly n acetylglucosamine homopolymer. And it's partially deacetylated and the deacetylation level really varies depending on where you isolate it from. So the fact that this single polymer is produced by so many different types of bacteria really led us to believe that this is a, you know, a really key carbohydrate for a lot of bacterial biofilms and potentially a good target for preventing some type of pathogenicity in these bacterial biofilms. So what was known about these systems, it's been fairly well fleshed out by a few different microbiology labs. In the gram-negative systems, uh, Tony Romeo's lab really started the work and showed that it was a four protein system that was producing this exopolysaccharide. So it's a little more simple than some other bacterial uh, polysaccharide producing mechanisms. So we've got two proteins that come together on the inner membrane in the gram negatives in a cyclic digm or cyclic digmp dependent manner. And then that uh, allows polymerization 1,6 from the soluble N-acetylglucose, UDP N-acetylglucosamine. That 1,6 links polymer is then passed into the periplasm, and then that is partially deacetylated by the deacetylase protein PJB. That is then passed through a porin with a long TPR domain into the extracellular space. In the gram-positive systems, it's pretty similar, although there's a little bit more debate as to how the transferase is working, and, and potentially one of these proteins is a succinylation um, dry succinylation also of the polymer, but that hasn't really been definitively proven. And in this case, because we've only got a single membrane, the deacetylation actually occurs on the surface. So what we became interested in was the deacetylases, because it turned out that if you genetically knock those deacetylases out in either the gram-negative system or in the gram-positive system, it changed the way the bacteria made biofilms. They were no longer able to make good biofilms, and they were much less virulent in most animal models that tested these. So in the E. coli system, it was thought that the polymer was still produced, but it was actually unable to be exported. And in the staphylococcal system, it looked like it was actually being produced, but it was no longer binding to the surface of the bacteria and it was being sloughed off. So we actually spent quite a bit of time looking at these deacetylases and we've worked a lot with Lynn Howell's lab and determined st some structures of these deacetylases in both gram positive and gram negative systems. And Glyconet actually supported us in doing a high throughput screen to try and find some good inhibitors to these deacetylases because they seemed like they were good targets and were key to these polysaccharides in the biofilm, biofilm formation. And so those uh, screens went, you know, as screens usually do, gave a lot of compounds that had some activity and some compounds that seemed like they had better activity than others. Um, but it became pretty obvious fairly early on as we were trying to validate these compounds and actually validate their mechanism of action, we really needed a good way of actually measuring the formation of the polyanacetylglucosamine on the bacteria and what that was doing to the way the bacterial biofilm was forming. So we needed some way of actually quantifying that we had changes in the polymer production using these inhibitors and not just we were affecting some other aspect of the bacterial growth that was affecting our biofilm assays. So in thinking about how we could detect this polymer, I mean, there's quite a bit in the literature on how to do this. Um, people commonly have used things like WGA. That's an obvious choice, right? So that's a lectin that has affinity for N-acetylglucosamine. So that's, that's nice because it's commercially available and it's easy to work with. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that bacteria make lots of things with N-acetylglucosamine in it in them and uh, that there's a lot of non-specific binding to other structures. So you've got to be really careful that what you're looking at is actually the poly N-acetylglucosamine you're interested in and not some other bacterial structure. Um, the other possibility is antibodies and actually Gerald Pear's lab's done a fair amount of work on developing antibodies against poly N-acetylglucosamine as potential therapeutics. Uh, it seems like things are going relatively well with Gerald's lab. Um, they have some things that they say are in the clinic, looking at specific bacterial infections trying to bind to the poly N-acetylglucosamine. So this was definitely a possibility and something we explored. And Gerald was quite generous, but we really needed quite a lot of antibody to uh, do the assays we intended to do. So it was kind of limited by Gen Gerald's generosity and these things aren't quite commercial yet and they can't be easily expressed. So we kind of thought about what else could we use? And we turned to this other protein that's actually been in the literature for quite a while and is a nice way of actually breaking down polyanacetylglucosamine base biofilm. So this protein dispersin B, 
was isolated by Kaplan's lab from a uh, transposon mutagenesis screen in this actil actinobacillus strain. So they found some strains of bacteria that actually overproduced the biofilms. And they found that what was mutated in those strains was this uh, glycosyl hydrolase from family 20. So this enzyme, after lots of work and a few publications, has been shown to be uh, specific for cleaving polyanacetylglucosamine. So I noticed Miles Poulin is also one that's called today, which is great because he has his lab has done some really nice work on this recently, looking at different substrates for uh, dispersin B, and has shown that it does have endo as well as exo activity, and it has a small preference for actually deacetylated regions of the uh, substrates. So we kind of saw this as a fairly broadly specific. PNAG active enzyme. It can bind both the, or it can chew up both the acetylated and the deacetylated regions. And the other nice thing about it is it can be easily expressed in E. coli in large amounts. So we had the idea that perhaps what we could do, since we were just looking for a probe of the presence of polyanacetylglucosamine, maybe what we could do is just go in, make some active site mutants, and take advantage of the affinity of the enzyme for polyanacetylglucosamine and use that for actually looking at our biofilms. So there's uh, crystal structures of dispersin B that have come out of Kaplan's lab. And by homology, it's fairly obvious which are the catalytic acid and base residues in the mechanism of that uh, hydrolysis. And what we did is we went in and mutated uh, asparagine, or sorry, asparagine, glutamic acid 184 to glutamine. And that was known in the literature that that was a key residue. And we validated that, uh, mutating that, and then doing biofilm assays and ensuring that we didn't have any activity from that resulting mutant. So what you can see here is that you know the wild type protein is very active in a biofilm dispersion, a dispersion assay. So if you're not familiar with looking at these assays, we're looking down on the top of a 96 well plate. And the dark color within these wells is the biomass or the bacteria that is formed in the biofilm. And even at levels of 10 picomolar of dispersin B, we actually get significant dispersal. And as we go up to 100 picomolar of the enzyme, there's basically no biofilm left in this biofilm forming strain that produces polyanacetylglucosamine. And if you contrast that with the active site mutant, you can see you can go up to 10 micromolar and still there's very little biofilm dispersal. So it's really, the, really a, a good mutant that doesn't have any activity. So then the question became, okay, well, if it doesn't have any activity, does it still behind polyanacetylglucosamine. And uh, we did a couple of different assays to try and find out if it was binding polyanacetylglucosamine because the affinity is quite low. And this was a little bit expected because the KMs of dispersin B for the oligomers is fairly high. Uh, usually uh, people don't actually measure the KM values because it's difficult to get concentrations high enough to actually get saturation of the enzyme. But, and what you can see here is that uh, doing a fluorescent quenching assay. So in this first assay, there's a few aromatic amino acids in the binding site or in the active site of dispersin B. And these actually change fluorescence upon uh, interaction with the polyanacetylglucosamine. And as we titrate in the amount of polyanacetylglucosamine tetramer here, so this is a tetrasaccharide, you can see that we start to get something that looks like a binding curve. We weren't able to saturate the binding kind of due to the limit of, limit of solubility of this polyanacetylglucosamine. But um, if we fit this out, it ends up with a KD of about six millimolar. So pretty, pretty weak affinity. Um, we weren't really confident with this number, so we actually contacted John Klassen's lab at the University of Alberta. And of course, he has great methods using mass spectrometry for measuring binding. And by spraying a solution of dispersin B with, in this case, an octosaccharide, you can measure the amount of bound protein, protein that's bound to the octosaccharide, and the amount of protein that's uh, unbound. And with that ratio and knowing the concentrations you put into your experiment, you can back out a dissociation constant. And in this case, uh, Elena Katova in John's lab measured a dissociation constant of about two millimolar. So again, a fairly weak affinity. So at this point, I was a little bit skeptical. I mean, we knew these were going to be weak. I was hoping for something high micromolar rather than kind of low millimolar. But um, we decided to go forward because one of the things we knew, of course, was that in these biofilms, there's a lot of this polyanacetylglucosamine, so a fairly high concentration. And we thought that perhaps this would be uh, sufficient to overcome these um, low affinities that we're seeing. And of course, we know that the enzyme is able to chew up the biofilm pretty well, despite the fact that it's got low affinity for the polymer. So there must be a reason that nature's designed the enzyme this way uh, so that it can get into the biofilms.
So what we did, and uh, the student that was working on this was Alex Denden, and he did some really nice work both expressing and characterizing these proteins. So he's done the majority of the heavy lifting in these uh, things I'm talking about today. We made some fairly simple constructs, so an N-terminal fusion with GFP. And the nice thing about this is that now we know that we've got a more or less one-to-one -one correspondence of fluorophore labeling to, polym to uh, binding probe. So that's nice because if we know genetically that we've got a one-to-one -one correspondence that allows more quantitative experiments instead of perhaps if you had an antibody that was labeled with a fluorophore, that would be randomly labeled antibody. Or if we bought randomly labeled WGA, that of course would also have a heterogeneous mixtures of fluorophore to protein, making quantitation a little bit more challenging. Uh, it was expressed very well. So, you know, five to 10 mg per liter, getting five mg of antibodies, not a trivial task, but we could easily get five milligrams of this probe to work with. And the other thing is that now we're looking at something that's really monomeric, right? So uh, if we've only got a single binding site and we've got a single fluorophore, that really allows us to understand the binding equilibrium at a fairly uh, simplistic level. You know, it's not a complicated situation where we've got avidity to worry about, where we get multivalency and it's a little bit more challenging to think about what's going on. It's really monomeric and this can tell us a little bit more about the amounts of the polyanisatoglucosamine that are present at the surface of the bacteria based on the binding equilibrium. So just to make sure that we only had a single site on dispersin B, we went in and mutated some of these aromatic amino acids that were close to the two catalytic acid residues in dispersin B. And everybody knows that uh, aromatic amino acids usually are found in carbohydrate binding sites. These often stack with the hydrophobic faces of the pyranose rings. And so we thought if we mutated a few of these out, we'd actually result in uh, having something that had much weaker affinity for polyanisatoglucosamine. So these would be our control proteins to make sure that all of the binding that we're seeing is really localized to the active site of the protein and not farther away on the binding surface. You could certainly imagine that we might have a, a, a cryptic binding site perhaps farther away on the surface of dispersin B that nobody's had characterized before. Okay, so with this in hand, we can do a fairly straightforward binding assay actually on the bacteria, which is nice. So we have these bacteria that were actually developed in Tony Romeo's lab. It's a carbon storage regulator knockout that overproduced polyanisetylglucosamine. So these overproducers of polyanisetylglucosamine, we can simply load those in a little microfuge tube with a spin filter in it. So just a two micron spin filter. We put in our probe with the GFP fusion that binds to the bacteria of interest on the polyanisotoglucosamine we hope. Doing a spin allows us to collect whatever doesn't bind to the bacteria. Do a wash, collect the wash fractions. And then what we do is we do a treatment with the active dispersin B, the one that chews up the biofilm. And that allows anything that's stuck to the polyanisotoglucosamine to be released. And we can collect that elution fraction. So this, I like this experiment because it allows Alex to actually see how much fluorescence he's putting into the experiment, and then we can quantify how much fluorescence we're getting back. So we really have a nice accounting of where everything has gone in the experiment. So we started out doing some uh, measurements of these, and this uh, first panel is two different cell lines, so or two different uh, strains of E. coli. This BW2511-3 is uh, the parent strain of the CSRA knockout um, e. coli. So this one doesn't produce very much PNAG or none at all. This one does produce overexpressed PNAG. And what you can see now is that most of the protein with the GFP fusion to the dispersin B mutant actually flows through in the bacteria that don't have any uh, PNAG being present. The ones that actually are overproducing PNAG, the majority of the probe actually sticks to those bacteria and we can elute that with treating with dispersin B. We can look then at the mutants in the active site where the aromatic amino acids have been changed out. And you can see that knocking out these aromatic amino acids in the binding site dramatically reduces the amount of probe that's actually bound to the bacteria that are expressing PNAG, suggesting that that active site is the major binding site for the polyanisetylglucosamine. So really we do only have one site on this dispersin B protein. So because Alex is so careful, we actually made some interesting observations in these binding experiments. And of course, one of the variables you can change when you're looking at these binding experiments is how many bacteria do you actually load into your spin tube? Um, and you can change that by just growing more bacteria, spinning them down and putting them in the spin tube before the experiment starts. And this is one of the experiments Alex did. And what you can see here on the y-axis is we're just increasing the amount of cells in that spin tube. 
And that looked kind of okay when we plotted out like this, but when we actually look at the amount that's bound, it had a bit of an unusual behavior. What we found was that early in the titration, if you add more cells, you get more pro-binding. But when, when it really saturated at about 70%, where no matter how many more cells Alex put into the experiment, he never got complete retention of the probe. So this is really counterintuitive because as you usually do a titration, as you increase the amount of uh, ligand that you're putting into the solution, you expect that the binding would increase. But what we're seeing here is we're not getting an increase in binding after a certain point, no matter how many cells we put into the solution. So uh, Alex and I scratched our heads a little bit about this result and we had a few ideas about what might be going on, um, mainly built around ideas of uh, non-even distribution of the polyanacetyl glucosamine on the surface of the E. coli, and I'll kind of flesh that idea out going forward. But before we really tested that hypothesis, one of the things Alex wanted to do was see if he could make a higher avidity dispersion B brace probe that would actually support there being a, an importance of the affinity of the probe for the surface of the bacteria that's affecting this titration curve. So what he did was he genetically, again, added the biotin ligase substrate peptide to the end terminus of the GFP. And that's nice because then you can treat it with biotin ligase and get a biotinylation event on that peptide. And once you have the biotinylation event, then you can throw in streptavidin. And I you know, say this is really easy, but Alex did some very careful uh, size exclusion chromatography to actually isolate the tetrameric uh, streptavidin GFP P dispersion B probe. So now this is tetrameric and everything that has multiple binding sites is gonna have higher avidity. So we really expected this to have much higher avidity for the polymer um, than the monomer did. So repeating the same experiment now with this tetrameric probe, we got more or less what we would expect for something in a in usual titration. As we increase the number of cells in the spin tube, more PNAG is present, more binding occurs, and in this case with the tetrameric one, about 95% retention of that probe onto the biofilm F, we got enough cells in the tube. So that looked good, that's kind of what we'd expect. So we really needed a hypothesis that explained the 70% retention by the monomeric one. So the hypothesis that we came up with um, is based on the idea that the PNAG isn't evenly distributed on the surface of the E. coli. And so if that's the case, what could happen now is early in the titration, as you increase the number of cells in the uh, supernatant, in the mixture of the dispersion B fluorophore probe, you're increasing the number of, or the amount of PNAG in solution. Increasing the amount of PNAG in solution, we call that what maybe the first regime of the titration. But then you get to a certain point and you can't increase the concentration of the PNAG any further. And that's what the titration is telling us. It's telling us that we're increasing the concentration of PNAG in the solution. We get to a point and then no matter how many cells in, we're not increasing it any further. And the way that this might happen is that if we have uh, small areas on the surface of the E. coli that have high concentrations of the PNAG polymer, we can't increase the concentration of cells high enough so that the number of cells is greater than the concentration of polymer within those islands. So what's happening is those spots or those small localizations of the polymer on the surface of the E. coli is actually controlled by the equilibrium constant of the probe binding to the polymer. And that would be in the second regime of the titration. And early in the titration, we don't have enough of these islands so we can't saturate the binding because there's not enough uh, stoichiometrically enough polymer there. So as we increase the amount of polymer, we get more binding, and then there's a maximum amount of binding we can get that's controlled by the dissociation constant of that monomeric probe. So just to kind of reiterate this and, and flesh out this framework, so what we've got is we've got a situation that we've called these PNAG islands. So if these islands have a high concentration of PNAG and these numbers are more or less just pulled out of our back pocket, they're just something to think about. If we had something that had maybe a 20 millimolar concentration of PNAG within it, we can't ever increase the concentration of cells beyond 20 millimolar because that would just equalize too big and a, and a suspension of E. coli would be not dense enough to actually increase it to the level of 20 millimolar. So the maximum concentration of PNAG we can have in the solution is 20 millimolar. <laughs> 
And if it is 20 millimolar and you have a dissociation constant for your monomeric probe that's also millimolar, there's an equilibrium that takes place there and that limits the amount that can be bound. If we have something with a higher affinity like our tetrameric probe, now that can easily be saturated. So this is kind of fun because what you can do now is you can actually, based on the affinity of the uh, probe, you can start to say something about the concentration of these areas on the surface of the E. coli. And we actually know that our dissociation constants, at least for oligomers, look like they're in the kind of one to 10 millimolar range. So that suggests that the concentration of PNAG at the surface in these uh, areas on the E. coli is also in the kind of low millimolar range. So that's a, you know, that's a lot of this polymer, but, and it really tells us how this uh, dispersion B probe could be binding at these high concentrations. So now, of course, the question goes, well, this is nice. It's all based on a titration curve, but can you actually see these things? So then Alex started doing some fluorescence microscopy. So that's what we've got here. So in these stills here on the left, we've got a series of cells that are at the same kind of stage of growth that the cells that we were putting in our spin filter tubes were. And what you can see on these cells is you see these spots. So perhaps these spots are actually supporting the hypothesis that we've got an uneven distribution of the polyanacetyl glucosamine on the surface of the cells. Perhaps these spots indicate places of synthesis, potentially, of that polymer. And those are very high, of high concentration areas of the polysaccharide on the surface of the bacteria. You can contrast that with something like uh, rhodamine labeled wheat germaglutinin that we've got in red here. So in red, you can see that uh, WGA labeled, uh, rhodamine labeled WGA is very evenly distributed across the surface of the cell, uh, not like this punctate staining that we see with our just GFP dispersion B probe at all. Also, there's the uh, DNA back or DNA that you can see where the cells are. And nicely, uh, you can see, whoops. Okay, yes, that's what I wanted to say there. Okay, and then you can let the cells grow a little bit further and you can see that actually there's still a difference between the dispersion B uh, probe binding and the rhodamine binding. You can see in the case of the rhodamine labeled WGA, it looks like more of the cells around the cells are labeled, the periphery, whereas in the case of some biofilm that's actually grown on a cover slip, now the GFP dispersion B probe is actually more or less between the bacteria. So we're really fairly confident that what we're seeing here is actually the uh, probe binding to the uh, biofilm and the polyanacetyl glucosamine of interest. We could then take this into some other bacterial species that also produce polyanacetyl glucosamine based biofilms. You can see this first one is the one that we've been dealing with so far, this E. coli with this carbon storage regulator knockout. Uh, this is a Staph carnosis strain, which is a, a lab friendly strain that actually is expressing the ICA operon that is present in gram positives for producing polyanacetyl glucosamine. We also see good labeling of those. Staphylococcus SE801 is a clinical strain. So that one we get good labeling of. And then we can contrast that, that with some other bacteria like Pseudomonas aeruginosa that produce other polysaccharides uh, to make their biofilm and we get very little labeling of those at all. So we are uh, fairly confident that we're getting specific staining here. Okay, so development of the biofilm. So the fun thing you can do now is that if you've got a really good graduate student like Alex, you can say, can you make me a movie of this, Alex? And Alex says, sure, I can try. And so that takes a long time to actually learn how to do that properly. But Alex actually grew the bacteria on an agarose pad. So these are live bacteria growing in an agarose pad. And then within the agarose pad is that dispersion B probe. So it's able to diffuse through the agarose and actually find the polyanacetyl glucosamine and stain it. So what we're gonna look at here is the growth of these bacteria in this polymer. Okay, so I'll let this run through a couple of times and you can watch it. And of course the green color now is where that polyanacetyl glucosamine is being produced. So you can see in early time points, you definitely see these spots. And if you fix your eye, usually on one of those spots, what happens to it is it usually moves with the bacteria and then at some point it stops moving and actually fuses with the inter interbacterial spaces to make these masses of the polyanacetyl glucosamine. So we're still of course sorting out what all this means and uh, it's a bit like looking at an ink blot, you can kind of see what you want to see. But Alex and I have spent a lot of time looking at this movie. It's, uh, it's kind of hypnotizing. And these are some of the things that we've seen. So certainly at this early log phase, 
we can see that we do have this punctate staining, which is kind of supported by both our binding titrations as well as the microscopy. Uh, and we think that that is probably locations of synthesis of the polyanisotoglucosamine, or perhaps places of early aggregation of the polyanisotoglucosamine on the surface of the bacteria. Now, what's kind of interesting is if you watch these and see where those spots generate, you can actually start to see that sometimes those spots are actually in a helical banded pattern. So we'll talk a little bit more like more about that in a second, but there is quite a bit of precedent, precedent in rod-shaped bacteria for helical banding of different uh, cell wall components being synthesized in this kind of pattern. And then if we get up to late stages, we actually do see a lot of the polyanisotoglucosamine between the bacteria. So uh, as I mentioned, here's a few other examples from the literature of where you do see that helical staining. So MREB is kind of the bacterial actin equivalent. So this is kind of cytoskeleton in the bacteria. You see these stripes on the bacteria. PSL is a, another polysaccharide, uh, peptidoglycan stems and LPS, of course, you cannot see this beautiful picture of the LPS is also kind of these punctate stains that if you squint, look like they're lined up in helices. So we think that this is a, uh, a similar thing that we're observing with the polyanisotoglucosamine. So now what we're doing, what we're well set up to do is actually see what effects these inhibitors we've made for the deacetylation actually perform on the biofilm and the effects they have as that biofilm matures using this low affinity probe. So with that, I just need to thank everybody that's done uh, the work. And then, like I said, Alex Adendon really carried the torch on this project. He did an amazing job. Uh, only with his careful experiments could we've seen these things. The rest of the lab is always a, a delight to be with and a very helpful group of smart people that I, I really enjoy working with every day. At the University of Alberta, John Klassen and Elena Katova did the binding experiments by ESI. And of course, we're always uh, collaborating with the HAL lab and getting good advice from them on growing these biofilms and what some of these things mean. So with that, I'll thank everybody that's uh, stayed through and um, be happy to take a few questions. <laughs>